Now this appears to be just like some kind of a dust cover or shield. I don't really need to take this off, but just figured I'd look at the contacts, see how this thing works. So there you go. So what you got is you got a, it's kind of like a four-way switch. All right, so now I was able to get to the uh, backs of these, the heads of these bolts, loosen these two, take them out, which allowed me to drop this out of the way. And actually, I can, I can actually just undo these cables and take it out altogether. Judging from the looks of it, I don't think this was switched very much. Chances are they picked one polarity to, to weld with and did most of their welding with that. Not only that, but you see there's a complete absence of arcing. That is because there's a warning on the front here on, on the other label, basically letting you know not to switch this while the unit's under power. Because as that contact makes and breaks, it will arc and damage the contact area. So. You never want to do that on one of these old transformer welders. There's some good scrap copper on that, but I might just keep that unit until I'm sure I don't need it. Now I can really see these two capacitors right here that are uh, apparently notorious for going bad on these units. And one of the things to look for, I had mentioned earlier, is what I can see back there, which is oil dripping out from the back. I see a stain there and a stain there, indicating to me that both of these units are leaking. That doesn't necessarily mean they're already bad, but it could indicate that they were on their way to failure. In this particular case, I don't care because I obviously am scrapping this unit. But it does mean that I wouldn't want to use these capacitors right here as spares. Uh oh, misses his home. It wasn't her. Good. Smells like oil. These must be oil-filled units. Oh, look at that, guys. Any more? Do we need any more proof that this was made by Miller? Miller Electric Manufacturing Company, Appleton, Wisconsin, part number 31-602. I think I'll get right on the horn and order some of these. You know what I don't like? I don't like the fact that there is no rating on this. Oh, wait. There's something on the top here. Let's clean it up as if we can't get something off the top. Well, unfortunately, on the top here, I can see that there are little, like, boss areas where they probably would have printed the information, and it was either printed on there and purposely removed. Sometimes a company will do that because anybody who knows anything about electronics or electrical like this would know that this is a capacitor and they would know that you don't need to necessarily order a Miller part number 31-602 all you really need it says right on the top here that this is a San Gamo S-A-N-G-A-M-O that's the manufacturer it says right on it it's a mica capacitor so they even told you what this is so the other thing you need to know is you need to know what the working voltage is which would have been here but is not present also, over here is MFD, that stands for microfarads. That's the unit of capacitance that would tell us what this uh, capacitor is in microfarads. So there should be a number here that's also missing. There's also a placard here that says amps, which I guess would be the maximum current that could flow through the capacitor, which you don't usually see that kind of a rating on most capacitors, but maybe that's unique to... I don't do a lot of work with micro capacitors. And then uh, KC, which is stands for kilocycles, 
which is kind of an old way of saying kilohertz. One kilohertz is 1,000 cycles. So this tells you the frequency range that this capacitor is basically supposed to operate at. So these two capacitors here more than likely are in the uh, high frequency uh, circuit. Um, the other capacitor that's here is identical from what I can see and it's missing the same information that, uh, that this one is missing. So we're not going to get answers from either one of those. Let's see if I can identify these positively on the schematic. I can see right here that there's a lug, comes up with a copper strap, goes into one of the spark gaps. Then there's a copper strap right here, goes over to the other end of the other spark gap. And then there's this copper strap that goes over to, went across the two capacitors. So what that tells me is that the two spark gaps are in series and that the two capacitors are in parallel and the output of the two capacitors is in series with the two spark gaps. And then this strap is what's going into the two parallel capacitors. And that is going over to this huge inductor which I already know from messing around before that's got this big thick cable that goes over to the polarity switch. And the bottom of that huge inductor has got the thick cable that goes over to the negative uh, or the ground terminal. So I know I saw that over here. Here we go. Work. Okay. Electrode. So according to this, that's... Well, that's interesting. They're not calling that an inductor. They're showing that as a transformer. And do you know why they're showing it as a transformer? Because son of a gun, if it ain't, there's this wire right here. It goes over to the spark gaps. That wire actually is insulated and wound around this huge coil. So this actually acts as a primary or a secondary, and then this would be the secondary or primary, the opposite. This must be how the high frequency generated by this circuit is coupled to the uh, high current circuit. So the high frequency is induced via this coil into the, uh, the lead going to the, uh, to the work. That's neat. So hopefully this is focused, but Basically what we got is this switch with the dotted line right here. This is your polarity switch. STR probably for standard and then REV for reverse. That's the one that, that's one end of the big coil. Or transformer, I should say coupling transformer. So these are the two wires that are going to be going to that circuit. So according to this, one of them all right, so there's your spark gap right there. You can see it's three dots because it's the two spark gaps are in series. According to this, the two spark gaps are in series with, I'm reading this upside down, but it looks like one capacitor called C2. But I bet you dimes to donuts, that's actually the two capacitors in parallel they're treating as one capacitor called C2. And then there's another capacitor right here called C3. That runs from the top of that coil down to the work electrode. That's actually this unit right here. This is C3. This, C, this, this wire right here goes through the backside and goes up to the top of that coil. And this wire right here runs right over to, the, to that connection right there, which is the work connection. So.
I was going to bolt these to get these pieces of copper out right here, but interestingly enough, let's see if I get a shot of this, there's actually a little clip right here. Now that I took that nut out, I can, if I could just, it has to be pried up to reach past these tabs. There we go. Copper scrap. I wonder if I can get these bolts. Oh, I see. Behind those uh, copper pieces, two more nuts were hiding. I think I brought a wrench off that size. See how tight they are. Well, tight enough, I ain't gonna get them without a wrench. Alright. The battery's dying on the camera, so. I might quit today at this point. Startled myself. Camera battery died. You didn't miss much. I just took off that terminal board and I took off most of the uh, control wiring, which is uh, a lot skinnier and not worth as much. So I'll have that separate from the heavier, bigger cables. Well, just taking a few minutes, and uh, what I did was I unscrewed all of these uh, brass nuts and washers so I could take this wiring off of this board. And the uh, reason why I'm doing that is because I'm I could either take this wire and I could just throw it in the scrap pile with the other scrap wire, but actually, because it's got all these nice ring terminals crimped on the ends and it's good heavy gauge copper wire, this is really good uh, sized wire for uh, like wiring a dashboard on a tractor or something like that, gauges, things like that. So I think I'll just keep that as a, keep that together like that for now until I need it. I try and keep my scrap wire kind of organized. This whole bin right here, this is uh, destined for the scrap yard. Um, there is actually quite a bit of usable wire in there. Uh, I could save it for the same reason, but I've got so much. This is what I keep. Uh, this is more, uh, a lot of that wire is newer, copper uh, cables and things like that. Uh, some of it has connectors on the ends. Some, some of these are cords that are still decent. So, uh, but they have one end cut off, so if I need to repair, like I've got a Milwaukee drill that uh, when somebody broke into a garage and was stealing things to bring to the scrapyard, they cut the cords off of some of my power tools that I had in there. Uh, so, you know, that I grab one of these cords and throw it on there to fix it at some point. It's just an extra drill, so I'm not in any hurry to do that. And then this is uh, a lot of heavier gauge copper wire. Some of that stuff, if it's not corroded, I'll save. Um, again, for wiring um, jobs that I need to do. And then the uh, stuff that isn't, I might actually take the time to strip the insulation off because the bare copper wire will be worth more at the scrapyard and I could put that in a separate bucket. But uh, for now, it just sits there on the floor. I'll save these little brass nuts and washers. Again, these are good. These are like the types that you would find um, on the studs on uh, gauges. Like, your, you know, your ammeter gauge and gauges like that uh, in dashboards on tractors and things like that. You know, you'll drop one of those, you'll lose it, and then you want to go replace it. Temptation is to put a, uh, a regular nut on because you have one. Problem is now you get a, a brass stud with a steel nut on it. You get kind of a dissimilar metal thing going. You could end up inviting a galvanic reaction type of cro corrosion. I believe that's the term. Anyways... Uh, so, you know, I've got a little drawer that I keep these little tiny screws and things like that and odd specialized screws in. I'll put that in there. The rest of this terminal board, well, I got a little terminal here. I could keep that. It's got several studs and brass nuts and washers on it. I'll just keep this as an assembly and throw it in the box with the spare airco parts. I'll probably just keep this board with these components on it as an assembly for now. 
until I'm sure that I don't need them. And then I'll probably just end up uh, scrapping this transformer for the copper. Um, not sure about this coupling transformer if I want to want to keep that. Probably not. I can't think of much that could go wrong with that. All it is is a heavy gauge wire wrapped in the groove on this, uh, what I'm hoping is brass. Let's see. Yeah, sure is. So that, that'll go in a scrap brass pile. So um, here's a good example of cables that I want to strip the insulation off of and just scrap them in the bare copper state because uh, they're worth more that way. And since it's such heavy gauge, it's worth the time and effort to me at some point to sit down and uh, just cut the wire, uh, the insulation off. So to finish scrapping this, I could just, uh, looks like what they did was they, they bent the, uh, crimped the ends here down. So if I uncrimp that end and the other end, I can just unwind this copper wire from this coil of brass. And then this brass is actually welded or brazed to these aluminum ears right here. So I might try and see if I can uh, whack those off with a hammer.